We've been preaching through the book of Acts on Sunday night, miracles in the book of Acts on Sunday morning, minor prophets on Wednesday night. I've been busy. And what a blessing it is to look at the book of Acts. And we talked last week about um, Peter's first sermon on the day of Pentecost. And here in chapter 3, we're going to see Peter's second sermon. And it is a time of refreshing that Peter wants to talk about. Now, we're going to read 15 verses, and then we're going to go into this sermon. How many ever went into a river and it was ice cold? Anybody? Slowly approached the deep water. That's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to go into the chilly rebuke of Peter and slowly get adjusted as we go into the deep, cold waters of this message. Amen. And so let's stand for the reading of God's Word. <laughs> Somebody said, oh my, it's going to be that bad. No, it's actually an excellent message from the Lord. Peter gives us. Verse 11, we're going to read down to verse 26. And then we're just going to kind of gradually make our way into this deep waters of the Lord. And as the lame man which was healed, held Peter and John. He was hanging on to Peter and John, this lame man. All the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's Greatly Wondering. Now, that Solomon porch is basically something that Herod put later for, for covering for people to get under. And it says, and when Peter saw the people coming, when he saw it, as they ran to see Peter and John and the lame man. He answered unto the people, ye men of Israel, why marvel at this? Why? Because Jesus has been doing this all along for three years. Or why look ye so earnestly on us as those by our own power or holiness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, had glorified his son Jesus whom you delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you, ye, denied the Holy One, the just, and desired a murderer, that's Barabbas, to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God has raised from the dead. You killed Jesus, but God raised him from the dead. Wherefore, we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Notice Peter didn't take credit for the healing, nor did John. He gave it to Jesus. He said, the faith of Jesus. And now, brethren, verse 17, I want that through ignorance, I kind of sense a little bit of doubt here, Peter, you know, sarcasm. Yeah, yeah, right. Through ignorance, you did it. As did also your rulers. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all the prophets, that Christ should suffer, he had so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive unto the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began." For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me. Him shall you hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear the prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, 
As many as have spoken have likewise foretold of these days. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made unto your fathers. Saying unto Abraham, In thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. He sent him to bless you, turning you away from every one of your iniquities. I'll give you an outline of Peter's sermon. Verse 16 and 17, you killed the prince of life. Verse 19 and 20, now you repent and be converted. And in the process, you'll have a time of refreshing. Number three, if you don't, you will be destroyed. Verse 22 through 25. I am telling you that Jesus is for your good. Acts 3, 26. That's, a, that's pretty much the outline of Peter's sermon. And it is an incredible outline. I'm going to draw a, a, a thought here from verse uh, 19. It says that when the Lord comes, if you will repent and, and be converted, your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come, of, come from the presence of the Lord. I'm going to talk about the times of refreshing may be seated. We preached this morning about Peter and John going into the temple at the ninth hour. We talked this morning that the ninth hour was a particular incredible time for it was at the ninth hour that darkness was over the earth when Jesus hung on the cross. It was at the ninth hour that the ground shook, that Jesus cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It was at the ninth hour that Jesus Christ said, it is finished, and bowed his head and died. It was at the ninth hour, the veil of the temple was rent. And so it was at this ninth hour that Peter and John went in the temple to pray. Now, we've talked about how Peter and John came and healed this lame man. And you, you hear Peter say, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And Peter took him by the hand, the lame man, and the lame man jumped up. First his feet, then his ankles, then his legs, and he stood up straight, his thighs. God did therapy on him. Jesus Christ miraculously healed him right there. You could probably hear the bone snap, crack, and pop. They snapped into place. It was an incredible miracle because Luke is a doctor and he was trying to explain. It began in his feet. It went into his ankle bones. It went up through his legs, into his torso, into his hips. He stood up straight. He walked. And he went walking and leaping and praising God to the house of God. That, my friend, is an incredible miracle. I guess the question we would ask today is why was John and Peter going into the temple? I mean, the veil had been writ. Animal sacrifice is gone. Why would Peter and John, being Jews, why would they go into the temple after it had already been judged? And I'm going to tell you why. Peter and John were not the ones that were um, mistaken. Peter and John were not the ones that were wrong. Peter and John were converted Jews that believed in their true Messiah, Jesus Christ. Their love for the temple had not changed. They went to the temple to worship God. They did not look at the temple as a violation of God. They looked at the temple as Jesus came, fulfilled the office of the prophets, died on the cross of Calvary, and the animal sacrifices are done away with. They went to the temple as a converted Jewish person being born again by the Spirit of God, and they went into that temple with no condemnation going into that temple. It was 37 years later that God used Titus the Roman in 70 AD to destroy the temple 
at Jerusalem. 37 years later. The book of Acts has about a 30 year history. And so about seven years after the, the flow of the book of Acts, the temple was literally destroyed. Leaving only synagogues left to go to and worship Jehovah. Now, because the Jewish rabbis and the Jewish religion of that day rejected Jesus Christ. And because of that, they began to persecute Peter and John and others like Peter and John and began to persecute them to the place they could no longer go to the house of God. So now they began to meet in homes. And they began to build churches. And they began to find places of gathering where they could gather together and worship the Lord. Paul still went to the synagogues. Every town he went to, he looked up the synagogue because Paul knew that the principle of the scripture was to the Jews first and also to the Greek. He knew that the way God did things was at first in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the world. So why, that's why Paul always went to the synagogues, there to fuss with them, to debate with them, to argue with them, to fuss with them, and tell them, you missed the Messiah, you need Jesus Christ as your Savior. And as a result, they rejected Paul, they rejected Peter, James, and John, they rejected the people that were right. They were wrong, the church was right. These Jews were converted and they accepted the true Messiah. But religion said, no, away with him, crucify him. And of course, Jesus was crucified. And out of that, Jesus Christ rose again from the grave and his ministry continues. Jesus Christ spent three and a half years opening blinded eyes, healing the sick, causing the lame to leap for joy. He was a miracle worker everywhere he went, raising people from the dead. Jesus Christ, incredible. And they said, we're going to stop him. When I say there, the wicked Jews that was hateful and rejected Jesus, they said, we're going to stop him. But let me tell you, friends, right now, three nails, a scourge, a Roman soldier, and a cross, and death itself can never, can never stop the mighty power of Jesus Christ. His miracles continue on. And we see that in the miracle of the lame man that was raised. It wasn't Peter and John that raised that lame man from, from his lameness at the gate. It was Jesus who did it. And Peter was quick to let them know that Jesus was still in business. Amen? They crucified him, but Jesus is still in business. Amen? Our government's so corrupt today, but Jesus is still in business. Our nation is so far away from God today in sin, when I'm talking about the nation as a whole, but Jesus is still in business. Amen? There's persecution around the world against the church of Jesus Christ coming to a town or a city near you. But Jesus is still in business. Amen. And he'll always be in business. Come on, can I get an amen out of that? Now, stop and think about this sermon. Well, I said we're going to walk into the cold waters of this river, deep cold waters. And the first thing Peter tells them when they start running... People saw the lame man that was healed. And verse 11, they ran. The Bible says in verse 11, the people, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's Greatly Wondering. That's the portico or porch, a long place, big place where crowds could be. How big a crowd? Well, I don't know. 5,000 people were saved out of this sermon. Must have been a massive group of people that ran to see this lame man who they knew that God had lifted and touched them. And when Peter saw it, verse 12, when he saw all these people running to him, Peter saw it, verse 12, Peter says, hold my coffee, I've got something to say. Well, wait a minute, they didn't drink coffee then. Hold my goat's milk, I've got something to say. And so Peter says, hold it, I've got something to say. And one of the first things he talks about is how you delivered up Jesus to the 
to be crucified when Pilate was determined to let him go, verse 13. He said, don't marvel at this. This is not by our power. Don't marvel at this. Jesus is still in business. He said, the God of Abraham, verse 13, Isaac and Jacob, God of our fathers, have glorified his son, Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when Pilate was determined to let him go. Verse 13. Verse 14. But ye denied the Holy One, the just, and desired a murderer be granted unto you. And you killed the Prince of Life, whom God has raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. First thing I want to point out is that Peter said you killed the Prince of Life. That's no way to start a healing service. How many would agree that's no way to start a sermon? But you see, Peter was speaking to Jews. He was talking to Jews. And this lame man being healed got those Jews' attention. They ran together. And Peter says, you denied the Holy One. You denied Jesus Christ. You crucified Jesus Christ. You, you, you. Notice in verse 3, it says, you delivered up. You denied you refused to let him go when Pilate was determined to let him go. Verse 14, you denied the Holy One. You murder, you let a murder be granted unto you. You, 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 you. I was told as a young preacher by those that are theologians, never use the word you. And never point when you're preaching. Don't ever point because when you're pointing, it's offensive. I guess the finger is not politically correct. And so he said, don't ever point. And they said to me, don't ever say you. Always use terms like we. We. Well, I'm not going to use we. I didn't crucify him. They did. Now, my sin did, but, I mean, Peter was making it pretty blunt. I mean, Peter didn't go down there to the, to the Golgotha's hill and drive the nails. The Roman soldiers did. Did the Jews crucify Jesus? Yes. Did the Romans crucify Jesus? Yes. Did your sins crucify Jesus? Yes. But, you know, Peter didn't say, well, I went down there, I was involved. No, he said, you guys killed the Son of God. He was healing the sick, raising the dead, great miracle worker, your Messiah. You denied him his right as the Messiah of Israel. Now you have done wrong. You, 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 you. Peter didn't have my instructor. Amen. I was told never point. Do this. Now you watch some of them smooth, slickly, slick oiled preachers on television and watch them go. Ooh, slick. Now if they want to do that, that's their, that's their, that's their prerogative. If they want to, ooh, that's okay. But I feel kind of funny if I do that. That's just not me. And I don't think it was Peter either. Because Peter used the term, you killed him. You killed the prince of life. And because you, how many would agree the water's cold right now? Woo-hoo-hoo, it's cold. We're walking into the river. It's cold. And boy, it's getting deeper now. Because Peter said, you killed him. You denied the rightful place of the creator of the universe. You denied him as Messiah. You denied him. Love that old song. I would not be denied. When pains of death seize on my soul, I cried into the Lord. I would not be denied. I love that. And I don't want God to be denied either. This morning in prayer, we're talking about the refreshings of the Lord. And I want to show you tonight that being baptized in the Holy Ghost is not a one event You can be baptized again and again and again and again in the mighty baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I'll show you that that in the scriptures in a little while. But while I was praying this morning, 
I said to the Lord, I want to touch you. I want to cause you, God, Yahshua, my creator, I want to do something to cause you to cry with pleasure. I want to touch your heart. I want to do something that will move your bowels of mercy. And it just seemed like the Lord was just all over me. Has anybody ever had God all over you? Well, I've had him both ways, all over me for good and all over me for bad. All over me for good is much better. Amen. Woo! Uh, you, you got enough tonight right there. If I stopped right now, you'd say, boy, the church was good. I got what I needed. Well, good luck with that. I'm going to keep preaching. You say, I don't believe in luck. I don't either. I'm going to keep preaching. But notice that he says, you killed the prince of life. Now, I want to point out something. The prince of life means that Jesus is life. Remember Jesus said in the Gospel of John, my father has life in himself, I have life in myself. The son has life in himself. What if I was to tell you that every molecule in this room is held together by the mighty hand and name of Jesus Christ? Go to Colossians chapter 1. Verse 16 and 17. For by him, speaking of Jesus, were all things created that are in heaven, that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. God Jesus Christ holds everything together. He holds my forgiveness together. He holds my blessings together. Jesus Christ has the whole world in his hand. Amen. He holds everything together. And Peter said, you crucified. You killed the prince of life. We've seen in Peter's first sermon in chapter 2 that we preached last Sunday night where Peter said, the grave, it was not possible for the, go, the grave to hold him. That he could not be holding of death. It was impossible for the life, for the living Christ. It was impossible for death to keep him down. Impossible for death to hold our Jesus down. Why? Because Jesus is life. And God raised his son from the dead. And Jesus Christ is alive and well. Still healing the lame man at the gate called beautiful. Still saving. Still blessing. So that's Peter's first point. And notice he says, we are witnesses that God raised him from the dead in verse 15. But I want you to notice something. The second point that Peter brings out, he said, because you killed him and God raised him from the dead, and because this lame man is sound and healed and Jesus did it, and because you violated and rejected the Son of God. Peter says, now repent and be converted for a time of refreshing. Repent and be converted for a time of refreshing. Look at verse 19 and 20. Now, verse 17 says, and now, brethren, I want that through ignorance you did it. I detect a little bit of, yeah, right, as did also your rulers. You did it by ignorance. How many of you remember Jesus Christ said on the cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. They don't know the magnitude of what they did. But it was ordained that the prophets that Jesus would be crucified and suffer for our sins. And that he has fulfilled in verse 18. He says, now you repent. Repent, therefore, and be converted. That your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Now, he's talking about the return of Jesus Christ in the future. But he's also talking about, in a lesser degree, a refreshing that you and I can have today. And the refreshing that they got on the day of Pentecost. A time of refreshing. Notice it says, you repent, 
be converted. I love it where Peter puts in converted because it's where Jesus Christ told Peter, Satan has desired to have you. Sift you as wheat, but I prayed you, prayed for you that you would, that your faith would stay strong. And when you are converted, strengthen the brethren. And so Peter knew something about being converted. Amen? Converted. You don't hear preachers say much about old-fashioned conversion. Now they just say, well, change your mind, little bless your heart. Come up here and shake my hand. It'll be okay. No, you got to be changed. Peter said, repent and be converted. Converted. That means changed. Repent means change your mind about Jesus Christ. Change your mind. You crucified him. You put him to death on the cross. You reject him. Change your mind who Jesus Christ is. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Change your mind. Repent. Change your ways and be changed by the power of God. Converted. And when you're converted and changed into a new creature, said the Lord will blot your transgressions out. Look at this. He says, that your sins may be blotted out. Now let me quickly say this because it's important that you see this. Your sins need to be blotted out. Go to Isaiah 43, verse 25. Isaiah 43, verse 25. Did you have a sandwich before you came here? Just asking. I mean, you don't have to get upset about it. Put some mustard on it, and it goes better. Isaiah 43, verse 25. God says, I, even I. Have you noticed that word even is in italics, slanting to the right? That means that was inserted there. So God said, I, I am he that blotteth out thy transgression for mine own sake and will not remember thy sins. Wow. Now the word blotted out, I used to think this word blotted out means you took a big old permanent magic marker and I used to think, well, my record in heaven's gonna be blots, black blots everywhere. But parchments in that day did not use the acetones that are in our ink and the printers we have. And so the acids that are in our ink or in the pens or in the printing devices we have today causes the lettering to blend in, to attach to the the paper. But in parchments, the ink set on top of the parchment And you could actually take a damp cloth and blot it out. Remove it. And I want you to know, God took his damp, moist, glorious mercy and blotted out my transgressions. He removed it from my record. Isn't that beautiful? You say, well, I don't believe that. Well, if you did, you'd feel better about yourself. Amen. And he says, when you, ha- when you repent and you're converted and your sins are blotted out, then the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And you shall send, and he shall send Jesus, which before was preached unto you. Meaning Jesus is coming again. But Jesus comes again to me over and over again. Jesus comes to me every day of my life. Jesus comes to me today, this morning. He's come to me tonight. Jesus is coming to you now in the Holy Ghost. And Acts chapter 2 says they were all baptized in the Holy Ghost and spake with other tongues. It was not foreign languages that no one knew. It was known languages, but languages that they themselves did not know. And in Acts chapter 2, they received the gift of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking with other tongues. They did not receive the gift of tongues. They received a gift from God that they could pray in tongues and worship God. On the day of Pentecost, they were not preaching. They were worshiping and praising God. Amen. What if I was to tell you that there's no limit to what God can do. This is a time of refreshing. 
Jesus Christ will come again and again and again and forgive you of your sin. Did you hear me? Jesus Christ will come again and again and again and again and forgive you of your sins. Jesus Christ will come again and again and again and again and refresh your mind and refresh your heart. Jesus Christ will come again and again and again and assure your heart in a troubled world. Jesus Christ will come again and again and again and infuse you with power. And by the way, Jesus Christ will come again and again and again and baptize you in the Holy Ghost. And remember what I said about baptism. When man baptizes someone in water, the baptizer is the preacher or the evangelist. The element is the water. The candidate for baptism is someone that receives Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. But something, had long, something happened long before they ever went to the water. It was the Holy Ghost that baptized that person into Jesus Christ. And it was called the baptism of regeneration. And that is the one baptism. You say, doesn't the Bible say there's one baptism? Yeah, and it's called the baptism of regeneration. When you got saved, the Holy Ghost baptized you into the body of Christ, into the person of Christ. But you can be baptized in the Holy Ghost over and over and over and over and over and over and over. And I'm preaching to some people that need it done to you again and again, baptized in the Holy Ghost, refreshed in the presence of the Lord, refreshed in the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and Jesus Christ will come and baptize you again. You say, I, I, need, some, I need some Bible for that. All right, I'll stick this in your ear. Acts chapter 4, verse 31. No, stick this in your heart. Acts 4, 31, they're praying. This same bunch that got baptized in the Holy Ghost in chapter 2 with the evidence speaking in the tongue now is praying in Acts chapter 4 verse 31. And when they prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and spake the word with boldness. Jesus will come again and again and again. And baptize you in the Holy Ghost. Now the Holy Ghost won't come again and again and again and save you. He saves you one time. He doesn't come again and again and again and make you a baby again and again and again. The Holy Ghost baptizes you by one baptism into the body of Christ. But Jesus will sock you under, bless your heart every chance he gets. Amen. Woo! Jesus will put you under. His power, under his love, under his presence. Refresh your heart. He'll put you under a refreshing. And Jesus will come and forgive you again and again and again. And heal you again and again and again. And encourage you again and again and again. And fill you with the Holy Ghost again and again and again. And again and again and again. <laughs> Woo! Now the water's starting to warm up a little. But the time of refreshing. Let me show you another. Verse 19 and 20 talks about that time of refreshing. But let's look at Isaiah 28, verse 11 and 12. Isaiah 28, verse 11. Actually, Isaiah 28, verse 10, 11 and 12. And this is the prophet Isaiah. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. For with stammering lips, tongues, and another tongue, tongues, will I speak to this people, to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, yet Israel would not hear. They would not hear. He's talking about Pentecost there. He's talking about having a refreshing from the Lord. In the presence of God, receiving a refreshing from the presence of the Lord. You say, well, preacher, do you pray in tongues? You better believe it. Let me hear you. I ain't tell I'm not on display. 
You just have to take my word for it. Now, you might sneak in here in the middle of the morning and catch me praying in tongues, but I don't flaunt it around. Now, if there's a gift and we have a gift of tongues, that's different. That's public utterance. And I'm not saying I won't turn loose and pray in tongues in the altar. I might. But let's understand this. It's not a circus and it's not a show. Amen. Wow. That went over like a lead balloon. The bumper jack just slapped out of the car. Now, here's what he says. God sent you prophets. Now, they loved Moses. God sent them prophets. Peter says, if you don't repent, be converted in a time of refreshing. If you don't, you will be destroyed. How's that for preaching? If you don't repent and convert, have your sins blotted out, you will be destroyed. And Peter said, I didn't say that. The prophets have said that. Your beloved hero Moses said that. Well, what are you doing dragging Moses into this? Because those were Jews he was preaching to. Moses was their number one head guy. Bringing the law to Israel. Look at verse 22 through 25. Verse, verse 22 through uh, 25. And it says, For Moses truly said unto you fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God rise up unto you your brother, like your brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. Listen to me. Verse 24. Yea. And all the prophets from Samuel to those that follow after, as many as were spoken, have likewise foretold of these days that Jesus would come, that Jesus would save. And in verse 25, he says to the Jewish people, you are the children of the prophets. You're it. You're it. And the covenant which God has made with your fathers saying unto Abraham, and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. So, Jesus, so Peter is saying by the Holy Ghost to these Jewish people, you need to, you killed the prince of life. We're getting into cold waters. You need to repent and be converted. Let your sins be blotted out. You need to have a time of refreshing. You don't reject what God's doing. Don't reject the spirit of God. If you don't, you will be destroyed. Now you say, well, preacher, where'd you get that you will be destroyed? Well, let's look at Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. Deuteronomy, verse 18, verse 15. How many of you would believe Moses? Now notice this, verse 15 of chapter 18 of Deuteronomy. The Lord thy God will raise up unto you a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, liken unto me, Moses is speaking. Unto him ye shall be, you shall hearken, according to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb, that's the law, the Mount Horeb, Sinai in that vicinity. And in the day of the assembly, saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, Neither let me see this great fire anymore that I die not. Now remember when the fire came down on the mountain, the mountain quaked, God gave the law, God came upon and, and sent signal to Moses and said, don't let the cattle get too close to the mountain. Don't you get too close. He came down. The utterance of God was so severe, it, it petrified and it terrified the children of Israel. And they went to Moses and said, don't, don't let him talk to us anymore. Please, don't let him talk to us. You go to God. You let God tell you, and then you come and tell us. That's what that verse is talking about. Neither let me see this great fire anymore, that I die not. And the Lord said unto me, they have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet, and among their brethren, like unto thee, this is Jesus here, Moses, then Jesus. I will put my words in his mouth. That's Jesus. 
And he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. But they rejected Jesus. And notice it says, if you don't listen to him, you will be destroyed. It's important that we understand that, look at verse 20, but the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. But he said, if the prophet's telling the truth, he's not going to die because he's telling the truth. But if you don't listen to the words of Moses, you will die. Notice in verse 25, back to Peter, the covenant, the seed given, the prophets come, and the seed shall the kindreds of the earth be blessed. But look at verse 22. Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you, your brethren, like unto me, and him shall you hear these things. Whosoever shall say unto him. And, I, and it shall come to pass that every soul which will not, every soul that will not, hear that prophet every soul that will not hear Jesus Christ shall be destroyed among the people wow the water's deep and the water's cold but not only did Peter say you killed the prince of life you repent and be converted for a time of refreshing if you don't you will be destroyed And then he uses a term kind of like this. I'm telling you, Jesus is for your good. Jesus is for your good. He said, where do you get that? Verse 26. The conclusion of his sermon, verse 26. Unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you. God sent Jesus to bless you. How's he going to bless you? In turning away every one of you from his iniquities. God sent Jesus to bless you. And not only did he send Jesus to bless you, but he sent Jesus to blot out your sins, to die for you, to rise again from the grave. And what you did was in ignorance, even if you thought you knew what you were doing, it was really stupid. But in the process, God had a plan. Don't you love it when God can use stupid people and smart people both? Amen. 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 Don't you love it when God can use bad kings and good kings as well? In our day, God uses bad kings, bad kings, bad kings, bad kings. But aren't you glad? Amen. Amen. Hello. Saul was a pretty bad king. Amen. Amen. David came along, and he was bad, but he knew to repent. He knew to get times of refreshing under the Lord. And this sermon that I just preached to you, not my sermon. This is Peter's. I'm plagiarizing now. Peter preached this sermon. Guess what? 5,000 people received Jesus Christ as their personal Savior through this incredible second sermon of Peter. 5,000 people gave their hearts to Jesus Christ. Now, that's a sermon. He preached less than five minutes, and 5,000 people got saved. He preached less than three minutes, his first sermon, and 3,000 people got saved. This third chapter, you got to agree. This is an incredible second sermon of Peter. And you have to agree the miracle of the lame man. You may be struggling today. You see, Jesus Christ went by that lame man many times at the eastern gate. But he never healed him. I think Jesus was saying, he's on my bucket list. I'm going to heal him. But I'm going to heal him after I go back to the Father. And I'm going to use Peter and John to heal him. And Jesus did heal him. Isn't that good? Wow. I love the Word of God. I love the power, the wisdom, 
the might of it. But let me say to you, repent, be converted, that Jesus can blot out your sins so that you can have a time of refreshing. I had a time of refreshing this morning. Right up here on this platform, early this morning, about 5 o'clock this morning, God baptized me in the Holy Ghost. Again. I'd be driving down the road and God baptized me in the Holy Ghost. We, we want to make it a one-time thing. But I never will forget the story I heard J. Vernon McGee talk about. A lady that got saved and they would stand up in them old testimonies. And down in Texas, and this lady stood up and said, I got baptized in the Holy Ghost. She said, I've been full of the Holy Ghost for 40 years. None of it has leaked out, and none of it has been put in. And an old Texan stood up in the church and said, yes, lady, and I bet it's got wiggle tails in it by now. We need the fresh anointing of God. We need a refreshing. We need personally a revival, personally a revival. We need a baptism of the Spirit of God. We need a refreshing from the Lord. If there was ever a time that we need as individuals a refreshing from the Lord, it's now. Our children need us to have a refreshing from the Lord. Our grandchildren need to have us to have a refreshing from the Lord. Our neighbors, those around us, this generation knows nothing about the power of God. Amen. This generation knows nothing about the mighty outpouring of the Spirit of God. Now, when I say this generation, I, I'm not saying everybody. There's millions of people that knows about the refreshing of the Lord. But you know what I'm talking about. This generation that get their kicks out of burning down cars and burning down buildings and protesting and doing their sin and their evil. They, they don't know anything about God. But let me tell you, friends, we're going to lose this generation if we don't get ourselves a refreshing from the Lord. Amen? We need that refreshing from the Lord. Well, you glad you came? How many like this book of Acts? We'll be in chapter 4 next, next Sunday night. We'll be in chapter 4. We'll be in Habakkuk uh, Wednesday night. I'm working on another miracle in the book of Acts. It's a it's the first miracle of Apostle Paul. He was known as Saul then. It's an incredible miracle. It's an amazing miracle. I'm not sure I can get a lot out of it, but I'll try. I'll see what we can find. Because there is majesty in whatever God does. Amen. He gives us a sunrise, and it's breathtaking. He gives us a sunset, and it's breathtaking. When I was younger, when it's storming and raining, you know, I looked at that lightning and snapping across the clouds and the thunder, and that's breathtaking. Breathtaking. And then when I got in an airplane that went above the clouds, and I looked down at them big old cotton balls floating in the sky, and it was breathtaking. We've got a God that knows how to take our breath and give us breath. No one dies without his permission. No one falls without his permission. He has everything under his control. Amen. Amen? Now, I know you can't make anything hard for God, but I don't want to be guilty of making anything hard for God. I want to be present. When the Lord calls my number, I want to be here. Here. Amen. Bless your heart. If I've got clothes on when they call the roll call, people's worried about going to heaven naked because of the rapture and they lose their clothes. Bless your heart. If, I'm, if they have roll call and I've got clothes on, here, and my robe will just fall to the ground. It won't matter. Amen. It won't matter. I had somebody tell me one time, well, I'm going to go to heaven on your shirt tail. 
I said, no, you're not. I'm going in naked. <laughs> what a glorious God. Someone says, well, what about clothes? You know, you see them movies where the britches are in the floor and the shoes are there. Or some guy's been sitting on the pot and, and the coats fall down over the toilet stool. And got shoes and, and the Lord came and all these clothes are laid everywhere. Well, have you stopped to think that in the Mount Transfiguration when Jesus was changed into his glory power and his glorious apparel have you ever stopped to think that god's radius and power and light was so incredible that it changed the clothing that jesus was wearing isn't that beautiful that's another sermon for another day i hope you enjoyed tonight i've enjoyed it it makes me feel better about my preaching when i say you or I point, or I tell people they're going to hell without Jesus. I feel better about it now. Because Peter ain't no better than me. In fact, he's better than me in that area. We need to have that refreshing from the Lord. Stand with me. We're going to give an invitation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Don't you love the book of Acts? Hey, 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 you don't want to miss all the good things the Lord has given us. Let me encourage you. Let me encourage you when you get home tonight, if you have time when you get home tonight, go to the back room and get on your knees and say, God, I need a refreshing. If you're not able to do that, set some time aside this week and find some time to get alone with God and say, God, I need a refreshing. I need your refreshing. And Jesus will forgive you again and again and again. He'll heal you again and again and again. And Jesus will hear your prayer again and again and again. And he'll baptize you in the Holy Ghost again and again and again. When the times of refreshing, we need a refreshing. Altars open as Josh plays and sings. We're glad you came tonight.